Hello everyone and welcome to Sunburned Albino lists every game he's played this month. This month being two months, both March and April of 2021, which we have merged because March had very little going on and April had very little going on, so we combined them to have at least something going on. As always, anything I've played in previous months won't apply to these months, so let's get started. Number 1, Loop Hero. A relative hit among the indie community, Loop Hero is a roguelike adventure on Steam that takes control of the hero out of your hands, instead tasking you with facilitating her growth by placing obstacles and enemies in her path as she loops around the field trying to get strong enough to eventually fight the boss. It's a balance of placing enough enemies to give her the XP she needs, but not too many that she gets demolished, among environmental factors that alter things and boost stats, while also managing her equipment. I found it to be fun for a few hours, some of you might like it more or less, who knows, it's your brain. Number 2, Skyrim. If you watched any of my streams in the last two months, you know I got way back into Skyrim again and dragged a bunch of you back in with me. Console Skyrim was made to feel almost brand new after I downloaded a 60fps mod made for PS4 Pro and PS5, which almost makes it feel like a remastered version for free. I'm at the point where I find Skyrim to be borderline unplayable without at least a few convenience mods like infinite carry weight and raising the pickpocket chance cap to 100%. But the right mods will always make Skyrim worth playing until The Elder Scrolls VI comes out and becomes the only video game to exist that year. Number 3, Luck Be a Landlord. A bit of a weirdo indie game. Luck Be a Landlord is an interactive slot machine roguelike where you choose which symbols go in the machine and try to create combinations that pay out massively so you can afford your rent, which is always due after a certain number of spins. I think it's still in early access and they're actively working on it, but even though this game didn't really end up doing anything for me, it definitely works within its audience. Number 4, The Binding of Isaac Repentance DLC. There's a new DLC for The Binding of Isaac, and I've spent a solid 20 hours or so not even really playing it because I've been needing to grind to get unlocks I never got in the last one. I unfortunately put most of my hours into the PlayStation version of Afterbirth back in the day, so my Steam version, where the DLCs always launch substantially ahead of time, is lacking in progress. Sometimes I like this game, sometimes I absolutely despise it. It's a very hot and cold roguelike for me, where I only really feel good playing it if my stats are more than adequate or I've got a cool build going, which is not even most of the time. Still, it's one of the deepest roguelike experiences you can get with the largest amount of unlocks by far, so it always draws you back in. Oh, and it saves after every floor, something Returnal could learn from, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Number 5, Balan Wonderworld. In the last video I think we talked about the demo, but the real thing is here, and it's still awful. I will start by giving them one credit where it's due. Since the demo, they increased your character's run speed by a substantial amount, and that has greatly improved traversal. It no longer takes half an hour to get from one side of a platform to another. However, you will still have an agonizing time performing any of the tasks the game expects of you, while losing access to your favorite costumes over and over again, forcing you to go back to early levels and reacquire them, dealing with the fact that only a select few costumes are suitable for general navigation, while most of the others are unwieldy gimmicks that can't do so much as jump. This game acts like it was made by people who have never played a platformer before and is enjoyed by the same people. These are PS1 mechanics, but even that's an insult to gems like Crash Bandicoot and Spyro, who were ten times more functional back then than Balan Wonderworld is now. And I paid full price for it at launch, that's the real wonder here. If my boss ranking doesn't end up recouping those losses, I'm gonna be pissed. It still hasn't, so go watch it, please. Number 6, What the Dub. Every so often, a random Jackbox Party Pack reject becomes its own party game and tries to entertain on its own, and sometimes it succeeds well enough if you happen to be drunk. With footage taken from my drunk stream, aka the only time I ever played this game, What the Dub lets you write your own subtitles for old movies to varying results. Only one person needs to buy it to host, so if you've got a group of friends who'd be into making inappropriate jokes over scenes with children in them, maybe this is for you. Number 7, Super Mario Party. They added online. After almost three years of only being able to play dumb little minigame battles online, they finally added online boards, friend invites, and passworded rooms, and it is glorious. There's still only four boards. If they really wanted to revitalize this game, they'd add some legacy boards from older Mario parties and repurpose them. But for now, it has certainly served as a fun resurrection you can now experience with your online friends or stream viewers and gotten closer to becoming what it always 
should have been. I've talked about the idea of Nintendo going the Smash Ultimate route with Mario Kart and making a Mario Kart Ultimate with like as much stuff packed in there as humanly possible, but that strategy could also work tremendously with Super Mario Party. If there was a Mario Party Ultimate that brought together hella boards and minigames and characters from past games, Nintendo is really not realizing this stuff to its full potential when they could become absolute legends. Number 8, Dark Side Detective. The sequel to this game came out recently, so I bought the original to see if I would like it. It's a point-and-click supernatural detective game where you find clues and use them to progress before the mystery solves itself for you. This game was touted for its supposedly great comedy, but as a comedian myself, I am not impressed. It rarely treads beyond anything that isn't obvious gamer humor and really in-your-face satire that feels like it was written for 12-year-olds who like dad jokes. The cases are like 15 minutes each, I played two of them and called it a day. Number 9, New Pokemon Snap. I've played this for about 4 hours so far and liked it more than I initially thought I would, but also probably less than the game wants me to. Pokemon Snap is a puzzle game. You've got to learn what to do to bring out the perfect shot, but that usually comes about in very erroneous trial and error, where you'll be restarting runs multiple times just to try and get one Pokemon to do what you want for that coveted 4 star rating. I enjoy my first two trips down any particular path. It's fun to see new Pokemon for the first time and watch them do stuff for a little while. After that, I want to be strangled by a Tangrowth or stampeded by a Bufalon. Getting that perfect shot does feel really good, though, and editing them with filters and stickers can produce some okay memes, but this game is too grindy for me to get too into it. Number 10, Judgment. Found this in a PlayStation sale for like 15 bucks or something, so I dove in. I knew Judgment was like Yakuza, but what I didn't know is that it is Yakuza. Almost identical games, minus the detective work, and take place in the same fictional city, but that's not a bad thing because as someone who is incapable of the multi-game investment necessary to fully engage with the Yakuza universe, Judgment offers a great jumping in point that requires no background info that I'm aware of. I'm only a few hours in, but I'm having as good a time as I had with Yakuza O. Number 11, Returnal. I thought this game was going to be awful when it was unveiled at the first PS5 Games Showcase. Later, its price was revealed to be $70, making it the most expensive roguelike ever created by pretty much triple what the usual prices for roguelike games are. I found that to be borderline offensive, since roguelikes are one of my most played genres, so my skepticism increased dramatically. Then the early reviews started coming in. 4 out of 5, 8 out of 10, 8.5 out of 10, 9 out of 10, 9.5 out of 10. I said enough! I will buy the game and see for myself! And so I did. I shelled out 70 US dollars plus tax because fuck Washington, and I sat down and started up this game. And it's pretty good. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is solid, the foundation is satisfying, the gunplay is arcadey and smooth, the exploration is rewarding. I've played Returnal for about 6 hours, which accounts for like 3 incomplete runs because the game is long as shit for a roguelike. The biomes are large and dense, I don't know how many there are, but getting to the third one while exploring every room took like almost 3 hours by itself. The game is incredibly long and your run can't save. You can't quit and come back. The developers actually have the gall to be like, oh, just leave your PS5 on rest mode and then come back. Like, we don't have other PS5 games we might want to play in the interim, or we might have a lack of interest in testing our luck with the PS5's inherent hardware issues surrounding rest mode. Plenty of roguelikes let you save and quit, or suspend and do other things, and those roguelikes have run times that are like a third of what Returnals are. Housemark replied to a tweet addressing these concerns by saying they hear us, but are not doing anything. Like, straight up, they just said, nothing to announce now, but keep playing and enjoy the challenge as you can. I have more time than most to play games, but my issue is that if I have a pressing engagement three hours from now, I can't play Returnal. I'm not going to start something that's going to end up being pointless when I have to quit in the middle and lose everything I've done. That said, when I'm playing the game, it's a good time. It doesn't seem like it has a ton of replay value once you do actually beat the game, just based on the permanent unlocks I'm already seeing, but it seems like the breadth of the playtime is going to be trying to beat it for the first time, and then after that you're pretty much done, which doesn't make it much of a roguelike, but still makes it a worthwhile third-person shooter. $70, though? Still nah. I still think it'll be free with PlayStation Plus sometime next year. It'll just be considered one of the good ones. Well, that's every game I played this month, and last month. Tune in next month for every game I played that month. Like, share, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter at SumburnAlbino, and I'll see you guys next time.